America has the Judeo-Christian ethic. China has the Confucian ethic. America, currently the world's longest-running democracy, has had 58 elections for the highest national office since the first one more than 200 years ago. China has had one national election in 5,000 years, about 100 years ago, and within two years of the election, the president declared himself an emperor, abdicated, and then died, and the country split into regions dominated by warlords. America has more than 200 years of experience with free enterprise and has been the world's leader in that field for at least 100 years. China experienced thousands of years of feudalism, followed by communism and the worst economic experiment of all time. Outside of territorial skirmishes early in the formation of the country, the U.S. has never been invaded by foreign powers. In the last 300 years, China was conquered by tribes from the north, ceded territory to those forcibly supplying it opium, had eight countries carve out their own sphere of influence, and was invaded and occupied by a major power. In the 1960s, the U.S. had the Vietnam War, Woodstock, sit-ins, Timothy Leary, free love. In the 1960s, China had the Cultural Revolution, the Red Guards, torture, work camps, total societal collapse. English has 26 of these. Chinese has more than 10,000 of these. They eat rice, we prefer bread. We like chicken prepared according to a recipe developed by a colonel with no military experience, who apparently was from Kentucky. They, wait a minute, come to think of it, they like that chicken too. And you thought we had nothing in common. People are people, that's the saying. And to a large extent, it's true. People around the world have much in common. But there are differences too. Critical differences. Generally the result of differences in culture and worldview related to things like history and level of development. Having lived in China for 10 years and doing business there for more than 20, it's always been interesting to me how people tend to overlook the potential for differences, to just assume people are pretty much going to think and behave the same around the world. When I look at China's history, its national experience, its state of development, I see differences all over the place. And based on my personal experience in China, I then see those differences reflected in the culture and the people. You could write a book about those differences, and I have. Here, I want to focus on one difference in particular, freedom and democracy. We tend to think everyone wants freedom and democracy, that these are universal goals shared by all people all the time. In fact, this isn't the case. While people can come to desire freedom and democracy, that desire is far from innate. You could produce a documentary on that subject, and I have. But let me summarize my point here. We tend to think democracy works like this, starting with elections and politics, saving economics for later. The problem is, this doesn't work. Countries that don't grow economically, and there are many, end up with so many political problems, they aren't really democracies. The problem is that traditional societies aren't culturally ready for democracy. Nothing ever changes in such societies, so people do not feel empowered like they have a voice or can shape their own future. Their position in life never changes. All bosses are authoritarian because no one can be challenged and the rule of law is weak. Elections really don't change this, but economic development does. Change and improvement become common. People feel empowered and, in fact, can make a better life for themselves. Since you can change bosses, bosses become nicer, fair, and the rule of law strengthens as the market rewards honesty. There's actually a lot of evidence that the old way of thinking about democracy is wrong and that this new way, emphasizing culture and the importance of economic development, is right. And it sure helps put China's behavior into context. You see, China is still in this phase, not quite onto the phase where political freedom is highly valued. That will come in time. Keep in mind, China has a per capita GDP roughly one quarter of the U.S. 40 to 50 percent of China's people still live as subsistence farmers. When the U.S. was at a similar level of urbanization, segregation was in full force, women couldn't vote, child labor was common. The U.S. has changed a lot as it developed. China has a lot more changing to do to get to democracy. All of this is highly relevant to the NBA situation in China right now. You see, from an American point of view, democracy is always a priority. All people have the right to demand it. So important is that right that Americans will give the benefit of the doubt to the Hong Kong protesters, even after the protests become violent. Plus, freedom of speech is also a priority to Americans, so anybody should be able to tweet whatever they want. But for the Chinese, democracy and freedom of speech, they're not priorities yet. 
National unity still comes first, as does resisting foreign pressure and influence. So the Chinese are overly sympathetic with the Hong Kong protesters and don't give them the benefit of the doubt once violence enters the picture. And they certainly don't think the NBA and the Houston Rockets should be spared their scorn just in the name of free speech. You cross the line, you pay the price. That's more the mentality in China. Now, none of this is to say that the Chinese position is the right one. Just that this is where China is now. Change takes time and often can't be rushed. This is one of those times. This is Dan Joseph from the Global Dashboard. Thanks for watching. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming videos in this series.